Now, listen, as we get into the sermon this morning, we're a few weeks into our sermon series on the book of Acts. I want to read you a few statements. Here they are. Turn me over, I'm done on this side. On the contrary. Yeah, country music. What binds all these statements together? What's the uniting feature of each one of those statements? Can you think? See some nodding heads? You wouldn't be able to guess it. But... uh, (laughs) <laughs> they're, they're actually the last words that three different people spoke before they died. Turn me over, I'm done on this side. Lawrence of Rome, while being burned at the stake. On the contrary, Henrik Ibsen, upon hearing his wife say that his condition looked like it was improving. Yeah, country music. Buddy Rich, on his way into surgery, a nurse asked if there was anything he just couldn't take. Yeah, country music. This morning, I read these last words to us because this morning we look at the last words of our Savior. Unlike these men, it's not the last words that he spoke before he died, but they are his last words that he spoke before he ascended back into heaven. And I've been talking about these words for a few weeks, and we are, have been in them, and today we're going to, I think we're going to finish on them. Last week, I I talked about what a pivotal moment this is as we look at these first verses in Acts. Christ's ascension is the exclamation point on the gospel. It's the finale. It's the great flourish. Of course, we have things to look forward to in the future, but of his gospel work and ministry, his ascension is, is wonderful. It was his... Death on the cross is substitutionary death that paid the price for our sins against God. But it was his ascension that secured our eternity with God in his presence. Because Jesus ascended and he now sits at the right hand of God, we can rest assured that on our last day when we die and we also will rise, we can rise and go with him in glory. Without his ascension, we couldn't say that. But he has ascended. It's the glory of Christ's ascension right there. This is the glory that all those that are found in Christ, all those that love Jesus Christ and put their hope in him, this is the glory that we will share in. It's a wonderful thing, the verses we get to look at this morning. Today I want to consider the last question and answer that the disciples asked Jesus. And as we said in the weeks prior, these words, the message, the lessons that they contain that they communicate are foundational to understanding everything else we're going to look at through the book of Acts. And it's more even important than just that because the work that's begun in this time, the work of Acts, still goes on today. So these words that we're hearing Jesus speak to his disciples don't just affect how we read Acts. They affect how we live because the mission of Acts is still going on. The book of Acts is complete. But the work that was started in Acts is the work that you and I are called to engage in. So it's very important. So let's consider these final words of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read the first eight verses like we've been doing, but we're going to focus on verses 6, 7, and 8 this morning. The word of the Lord. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, saying, which he said, rather, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and even to the remotest part of the earth. Thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you raise your hands and pray with me? Father, thanks be to you. We're so grateful for the work of Christ in our lives and the way that he's changed us, the way that he has given us freedom and liberty to enjoy this world and to look forward to the life to come. Rather, instead of having hopelessness in our, in our stomachs and in our hearts, we've been filled with uh, the truth that comes through your word. And Father, we pray as we look at it that you would show us something this morning that we've never seen before. Pray that we would consider these words in a new light, that we would derive um, some new eternal truth from them. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be honoring and pleasing in your sight. And we pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus, whom we love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, with the time that we have, I want to consider three things. Specifically, there are three things in our passage, specifically verses 6, 7, and 8, that the disciples fail to understand, and which Jesus, in his reply, seeks to correct. There are three misunderstandings which Jesus corrects, and we're going to look at those this morning. But before we do that, I want to consider, generally speaking, the comments that the disciples make and sort of the mood, the setting that that they're said within. We're told in verse 6, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now notice the way that Luke, the author, describes the situation. When they had come together, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. This is why we're spending just a little bit of time on this right now. When they had come together, who's the they? The they is the apostles that are referenced in verse 2. The they is the men, are the men, that are the closest friends of Jesus Christ, who traveled with him, ate with him, were taught by him, instructed by them, commissioned by them. These are the men asking the question. They were asking rather than a him or a two of them were asking. We need to recognize that. When they had come together, they were asking the Lord, saying... Notice that. There are times in Jesus' ministry where one or two apostles, would, disciples would come to him and say, Lord, what about this? And he would respond, that's not the case here. They're all wanting to know. This is not an inquiry of just a single man. The whole group is anxious. The whole group is curious. This also shows that they have a similar mindset about the things that are coming next. The disciples aren't arguing over it. They are all coming and saying, is this when it's going to happen? They were all asking him, saying, again, just pay attention to the way Luke writes. This gives us an inference into the mood, gives us some sort of connotation for what it was like to be there. It seems like sort of an a per- active, persistent thing they're asking. I was, thinking, I was thinking about this. They were all asking him, saying, Lord, is this, you know what came to my mind? All my kids, when they're asking when lunch is going to happen, Every mother in this room can sort of relate to that. It wasn't, hey, baby, what are we having for dinner? It was, mom, what are we having for dinner? What are we having? We're all crustered around. What? Well, I'm dying here. I haven't eaten in 45 minutes. What do you got for me? This is sort of the mood of the disciples. They were all asking him, saying, okay? Notice also the question being asked, Lord, is it at this time that you're restoring the kingdom of Israel? What time is being referenced here? That very moment? No. If we think back to last week, we'll remember that the time that they're referencing is when Jesus said he was going to send the Holy Spirit. He says, listen, wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit. He's going to come not many days from now. And so that not many days from now is the time that they're referencing. Lord, is it at that time, not many days from now, when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? When the Holy Spirit comes, is that when you're going to restore the kingdom? This is the last question that the disciples ask. It is perhaps the pivotal moment of their lives. I mean, it's kind of a silly thing to say. There were so many for them. But Christ's ascension, you know, is at least one of the pivotal moments of their earthly ministries. And this is what they want to know. 
You should think about that. It's sort of an interesting thing to think through. At this moment, that is the question that they want to ask. This is what they considered of most importance. They're no longer asking who's going to be the greatest. They're no longer asking, Lord, when we get into your kingdom, can I sit on your right and left hand? They've already had those moments and those questions. But now, right now, they're asking, is this time going to be when you restore the kingdom to Israel? Last, notice Jesus' reply. Think about what he says to them. Is this the sort of parting exchange you would imagine? Is this the farewell you would desire from Jesus? What's the tone of his response? What is Jesus, does, does, Jesus, does Jesus even answer their questions? I mean, if you have your Bible, look at what Jesus says and think about it. Is that what you would expect? Is that what you would want from him? We'll consider these questions that I'm just asking you to think about, but for right now, let's recognize, at the very least, this is a strange departure exchange, isn't it? It's an interesting question to ask Jesus, and Jesus responds in a way without giving him the satisfaction of a straightforward answer. And in fact, honestly, the disciples probably leave that conversation, that moment, with more questions than what they came into it with. They, at least they had some sort of expectation in their minds, and they were looking for a little bit of clarity, but Jesus seems to go, no, <laughs> you know, and, they, and then he's going to ascend in the next verse. We're going to get there, I think, next week, and this is the last thing they hear. So they probably leave with more questions than they came in with. It's also important that we recognize Jesus' love and affection for his disciples we see it here in, in the kindness and in, the, in, in the, 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 we see it in his words. But what I want to point out is that his love for these men and his commitment to them and his patience with them doesn't keep him from correcting them in one final statement. We need to recognize that this is a correction from Christ. It's not a heavy-handed rebuke. It's not saying, get behind me, Satan. It's not... Some of the harsher rebukes that Jesus at points deals out to the disciples for their own good because they needed it. But it is a correction. And we'll think a little bit more about that as we go. I was thinking about the idea of Jesus correcting them in his final words and then just being ushered up into heaven. And I was reminded of a time when I was a young boy. I was fairly young, but it was, I was old enough that there was such a thing as email. And um, I remember that I had been bad. I think I had been disrespectful to my mother or something like that. And that was, I, I, uh, that was a, I want to say that we got in trouble often for being disrespectful. Um, and I don't remember all the, all the punishments I received for being disrespectful, but it was a, it was a big deal in our house, as it should be. Uh, but I do remember this one time. This one time I was disrespectful to my mother. I don't remember exactly the situation, but I do remember the response. The response was that my dad had just left to go on a trip, like, that day. And I had done something, and uh, somehow my mom had told my dad what I had done. And he wrote her an email, and she printed it off and gave it to me from him. And it was a, a letter expressing his, you know, anger and disappointment at the way that I had treated my mother. And that comes to my mind, I'm not really trying to draw an apples to apples comparison between Jesus and the disciples and me with my dad in that situation. But what, the reason it came to my mind is that um, Jesus, I think the reason that that situation sticks out in my mind is that my dad wasn't there to talk with him about it. Does that make sense? I had, he had sent me this letter and I didn't have the satisfaction of just being able to sit down with him and hash it all out with him right there. So I was left waiting for him to get, you know, he'd, he'd expressed himself to me, but I was waiting for him to get back to deal with this further. And I think that that weight, that significance of him being gone, made that situation get impressed upon my mind. All right, you follow me? So what I'm saying here is, is we need to recognize this thing is, a similar thing is probably happening with the disciples. They ask him a question. Jesus, in love, but with firmness, offers a corrective to them, and then boom, he's gone. And they're left, and we're going to talk about it next week, going, 
And there's going to have to be an angel that's sent down to say, what are you still doing here? Get going. And they're going to be, you know, and I, so that's the reality of the situation. Now I'd like to consider the three ways I spoke of, which the apostles confu- uh, make, um, the three ways in which the apostles are confused about the kingdom. There's three ways in which the apostles here are confused about the kingdom of God. And I want to talk about why we're tempted to make the same mistakes. First, what is clear from the disciples' question is that they misunderstand the nature of the kingdom. None of the apostles were ready for the mission that Jesus had tasked them with. What Jesus was calling them to was something that was so grand, so expansive, so unearthly, so spiritual, that they were not able to perceive it. By this point in the ministry with Jesus, they should have known better. They should have known that what Jesus was calling them to was something that was far greater than anything they could have accomplished in earthly terms. But they couldn't have known fully. So here they are, confused. Confused. You know, I, thinking about this situation where Jesus is just about ready to leave them, I've, I've thought, it, you know, I have some children, some older, some younger, and sometimes we go on dates and we leave our older kids to watch our younger kids. And again, there have been nights where we have had the conversation about the way the evening is going to go in the house. Ali and I are on our way out the door. The food is in the oven. The timer is set. Take out the, turn off the oven. Bedtimes for this child. The diaper is here. The wipes are here. You know, I'm telling my older kids, here's exactly what you need to know. And then we're giving them kisses. We're walking over the threshold of our door to go outside to the car. And one of them will say, so how long are you going to be gone? 15 minutes? 20? What? Is there dinner? Did you make us dinner? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Didn't we already go over this? <laughs> this is what's happening. You know, the disciples should have, they couldn't have known fully, but they should have known more than what they know. Jesus has prepared them for his departure. And he's just about ready to go. And the disciples make it painfully obvious that they, they do not understand the nature of the kingdom that he's spoken so much to them about. They say, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So to begin, we see that there is a gross misunderstanding about the nature of the kingdom of God. Jesus speaks to them about the kingdom of God, and they interpret the kingdom as the restored kingdom of Israel. You remember, for 40 days, he spoke to them concerning the kingdom of God. You can't miss that co- contrast comparison if you're reading the text. Boom, Jesus is talking with them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. When they have the chance to offer up their last question, they say, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? That, that is a contrast that Luke is trying to make us see if we open our eyes to see it. It's right there in the text. They interpret the kingdom in earthly terms. They equate the kingdom of God with the geographical, national, political entity regime. And they couldn't be more wrong. John Calvin says in his commentary on this particular passage that in this question there are more errors with words uh, than there are words. He says in this passage, in their statement, there are more errors in their question than there are words in the statement. But how could have they interpreted Jesus' teaching that way? How could have they been wrong? How could have they misunderstood this? Well, the Bible says that what is of spirit is spirit and what is of flesh is flesh. It's a distinction between our earthly bodily mind and heart the way we think and what is born again of the spirit. We naturally have the desire to, to touch, to feel. The disciples wanted to feel Jesus' hands after he had risen from the dead and said, I'll believe when I'm able to put my hand here and feel. Our earthly, our our fleshly nature makes it the norm for us to desire our treasure here in this life rather than to treasure the, the, the glory of heaven. We want pleasure and ease and enjoyment now. And if we're honest, we really struggle with delayed gratification. It's really hard For us to keep our focus way up ahead on the horizon rather than staring down at what's right in front of us. We want things now. We want the comfort now. We want the enjoyment now. We want the glory now. 
No matter what it is, treasure, pleasure, vindication, ha, I was right, and now everyone knows it. Exaltation, I want to be, I want to be, I want other people to think well of me. Affirmation, whatever it is, we tend to naturally desire those things here and now in our time rather than waiting for God's time. This is our condition. And, of course, it's rooted in a selfish desire. We want what we want because it pleases us. And this is precisely the same condition that's at work in the disciples when they asked their question. But, of course, they weren't alone in thinking that Jesus' kingdom was going to come in an earthly, a political term, way. They were the norm, really, for their day. An earthly restoration is what all the Jews had been anticipating. It's what they'd all been expecting and looking forward to. So the, the disciples in their question here, they have been taught by Jesus, but in their question they're really echoing the sentiments of what the Jewish people expected. We're going through the Old Testament in our classes before worship right now, and I, if you're not a part of those, I hope that you'll come. They give you a wonderful high-level view of the story of Scripture and the way that the things in the New Testament relate to the things in the Old Testament, even the way that some of the old things and the, the, the prophecies in the Old Testament relate to what's going on in the kingdoms. It's very helpful. If you think about the big-picture arc of the Old Testament story, you have God appearing to a man, Abraham, and making promises to him, saying, I'm going to make... Your name great, and I'm going to bless the entire world through you, through your line, through your children. And then over a thousand years, you have that man's family tree just spread out. And they multiply and multiply. And over time, there's over several million of his descendants. And then later, later God sends, at that time, they're all actually captives in Egypt. So they haven't been conquerors. They had to wait for that. Delayed gratification, right? Trusting in God's promise and putting our faith in it. They had to wait for it. God sent a delivery, sent Moses. And Moses led God's people out of Egypt. And he led them in the wilderness for that time. And it was in that time that they really became, took on a new aspect of nationhood. They had been an, an ethnic race, but they have gone from being a family to now being a nation. And over time... Because of their sins, they, they say, you know what? We're not happy with God as our king. We want a, 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 a political human king like the other nations around us. So God gives them a king. And then the rest of the story of the Old Testament, after the, the, the three decent kings, is the story of Israel becoming fractured and really going up and down. And that's really the story of the Old Testament. God taking sinful men and women that fail and accomplishing his will in them and through them. But what you have when you look at the story of the Old Testament is great ups and downs all along the way, right? And for a large portions of Israel's history, because of their, their unwillingness to obey what Jesus, what God had commanded them, they suffer a lot, right? God gives them a, a promised land eventually, but then they get in and they're like, you know what? These people aren't half bad. Maybe they can be our servants. And so what happens? They don't drive the people out. They don't obey God. And then they end up being in bondage to those people later. You know, so there's the whole history is sort of this ebb and flow, God working through failed people. The nation of Israel has a rough history, a glorious history, a precious history, but it's a rough history. Throughout all this time, throughout the ups and downs, one of the things that the Jews anticipated was the coming Messiah. He would be their savior. He would be the one who would restore all things. The prophet said that he would be the one that would restore the throne of David. David was the golden boy of the kings, right? He, he was the greatest. He was like sort of the way that the Germans look back at like Otto von Bismarck for uniting the, the country through the wars of unification, right? He's their savior. He's the, David did so much for them. Well, there's coming a Messiah who's going to make every wrong right, and he's going to restore the kingdom. And this is what the Jews were anticipating and were looking forward to. There were many prophecies about this Messiah to come. In, in Isaiah, it talks about one who, it says, is there 
too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I'm reading a short snippet of the context, but Isaiah is speaking to Israel about God raising up from the tribe of Jacob uh, one who would preserve Israel, even though they are, they're going through hardship and in bondage. There's coming a day when things are going to be restored. Things are going to be made right. This Messiah is going to restore the land of their fathers. There's all sorts of prophecies that I could have read, but for, for brevity, you're just going to have to trust me, or I can give them to you later. But Israel is looking forward to this Messiah. There are many prophecies pointing through the time of their exile to a day in which God foretold where there'd be restoration and salvation, a day where their heads would be lifted, a day when they would no longer be living in shame. And so at various points in Jesus' ministry, after he was born and had started his active ministry, if you read the Gospels, you'll see there were many times, or at least a good handful of times, where crowds of Jews gathered around Christ thinking that the kingdom was going to be restored. You may remember in Luke's gospel, we're told about Jesus' triumphal entry, that last time that he's going up to Jerusalem to observe Passover. We're told that as he uh, was approaching the city, there were many traveling with him, listening to him along the road as they traveled. And we are told in Luke 19 verse 11, that as Jesus went into the city, they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. This is what the Jews thought. It is recorded that the crowds of Jews supposed that God's kingdom was going to appear immediately. This is their expectation. A physical, earthly, nationalistic restoration of Christ's kingdom is what the masses and the disciples were anticipating. And they were all wrong. But the disciples were more wrong. They'd been taught by Jesus for three years concerning the kingdom of God. How many times had Jesus told them some version of, my kingdom is not of this world? How often had he sought to teach them that the kingdom belonged to little children, not to kings and nobles and politicians? How many times had Jesus said no when those around him wanted to elevate him to a, some sort of earthly rule and dominion. Had he not told them, behold, an hour is coming and is at hand when the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners? Had they not all heard Jesus tell Peter to put his sword back in the sheath when he had sought to defend Jesus in the garden? Did they not know that Jesus would go to his death and open not his mouth? And of course, he's been resurrected, and so now they think, ah, well, now's the time. He's going to claim it. But no, they weren't paying attention as they should have. They knew all these things, and yet after his resurrection, they still presumed that Jesus would, would claim, claim a kingdom that was earthly, fleshly, ethnic. They dreamt of an earthly kingdom which would flow with riches and comforts and external peace and all the sorts of other good things. They made the great mistake of, and here's what they did, and here's how you and I make the same mistake. All right, listen. They made the mistake of boxing God's will into what they might have imagined. That's what they did. They boxed what God's will was into what they wanted. They made the mistake of thinking that God was like them and that he thought on their level. They hadn't grasped the central teaching of Jesus when he proclaimed that the kingdom of God would go far beyond the boundaries of Israel and that the greater son of David would initiate a kingdom with no end, a spiritual kingdom with earthly implications, not an earthly kingdom. This was their first mistake, and it's ours as well. Just as Jesus corrected his disciples, he corrects us now when we long for a kingdom that we can touch and feel and enjoy the benefits of now. He corrects us when we store up our treasure on earth rather than the unseen treasure of heaven. He corrects us when we impose our desires upon him. When we make what we want the mission of his kingdom. He corrects us when we desire to make heaven on earth rather than to seek his kingdom by pointing earth to heaven. The nature of the kingdom of God reflects the nature of Christ. Just as we will all share in his glory and in the inheritance that I spoke about at the beginning of our sermon today, 
We share in his simplicity and his humility and his sufferings on earth. He taught this. This is, this is plainly written in the Bible. The disciples wanted to be done with those things. They wanted to usher in the great reign. They wanted to be able to look into the eyes of the Romans and say, we told you so. They wanted to be vindicated and proven right, and so do you. And that time will come, but that time is not now. And it is not for you to know the time or the epoch which the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's what Jesus said to his disciples, and it's what he says to you and to me. So the nature of the kingdom, the kingdom that we anticipate, and the kingdom that we are told to seek on earth as it is in heaven, is not of this world. His kingdom won't look like what the disciples were anticipating or longing for. It won't look like a nationalistic structure. It doesn't reign politically. It won't live in sweet vindication over all the naysayers that doubted along the way. Seeking the kingdom of Christ will look very much like what Christ's life looked like and what the disciples' lives will look like. And we're going to see what it looked like as we go through Acts. Is this the kingdom building that you're committed to? Are you willing to seek his kingdom and his righteousness and trust him that everything else you desire will be given to you in its time according to his will? That's what he's promised you. Is that the kingdom that you're committed to building? Is that the kingdom that you're committed to being a part of and sacrificing for? Or is the kingdom that you're committed to building your own kingdom, your own desires, your own passions with a thin veil of Christ labeled over top of it to make you feel good? Are you willing to build Jesus' kingdom? Are you willing to walk in Jesus' footsteps? Are you willing to wait for the things Jesus says you're going to have to wait for? Are you willing to be patient? So the disciples confused the nature of the kingdom. They also confused the power of the kingdom. And they do so in a couple of ways, and I'm, we're going to talk about these a little bit more, but I want to say right now, they confuse the power of the kingdom in one of two ways, and there's two ways to look at it. They either think that Jesus' power is going to work directly rather than through them, or in line with their thinking about an earthly, fleshly kingdom, they presume upon fleshly power. This is why Jesus offers both correctives, stating that they would be the ones carrying out the work, but that the power of the Holy Spirit would be the power that they operate under, not their own power. It would be supplied by the Holy Spirit. Notice that in their question, they ask, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? Who's the you? They're referring to Christ. They're speaking to Christ. And in a way, th this is correct thinking. All that we do, all that we accomplish, is accomplished maybe through us, but it's by the power of God. God is the one who's working and acting. And so even as we accomplish things, God is actually the one accomplishing. But we must not only take into consideration the question that they ask as we read the passage and try to wrestle with what's being said here. We also have to consider Christ's correction in his response. Notice that they ask him, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom, speaking about Christ? With regard to their question concerning time, Jesus responds and he says that it isn't their place to ask or to know. There are certain things that they shouldn't know and they will not know. Same goes for you and I. Concerning who's doing the acting, though, he offers them a very simple corrective. Is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom? He says back to them, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you will receive power, rather, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. I think this is very striking in Jesus' words back to them. They say, how long until you? Jesus responds by saying, you will receive power, and you will accomplish it by the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. The shift in focus is obvious. It's a pointed change of emphasis from Christ back to the disciples. And you can imagine that if, again, if you were to put yourself in the disciples' shoes, you would have felt that shift in emphasis, wouldn't you? 
three years of teaching by Christ, 40 days of instruction, speaking about the kingdom of God, the work of the church, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And yet, at this moment, they still don't seem to understand it all. In John Calvin's commentary, he goes on and on about how frustrated Christ must have been with his disciples at this moment. And we can understand why that would be the case. Have I been with you so long a time and yet you still do not understand? That's what Christ asks his disciples elsewhere in the Gospels. Have I been with you so long and yet you do not understand? We make the same mistake when we pray to see God's kingdom without putting our hands and feet to the work of building his kingdom. How often we're lazy, wanting to relax, wanting to enjoy the comforts of the earth rather than digging for the treasure of heaven. How natural it is. It really is natural to all of us for our hearts to sit and eat and drink and be merry rather than to toil in the fields. Jesus says the fields are ripe for the harvest, but the laborers are few. Well, why? Because nobody really wants to be out laboring in the vineyard. We want to enjoy this earth now. We want to have our, our cake and eat it too here in this world. Why might this be? Because we want to think that somebody else will do it. <laughs> the laborers are few because somebody else is more gifted. It's not my calling. It's not the right time of life for me. There are other things that are more important. The excuses can fill our minds easily. God can accomplish the restoration of his kingdom by himself. Certainly there are others that are willing to do the work. Do I really need to engage? There are others that are better suited. These are the types of things that we say and the things that we do. And Jesus confronts us by saying, you shall be my witnesses. Or perhaps we see ourselves doing the work, but we also want to use our own tools out in the field. We don't want to use his. We don't want to depend on him. Notice that we are those being used, but the power is not your own. It is not your methods. It is not your own wisdom. It's not your own influence. It's not your own finances. It's nothing that you have to offer. God may use some of those things, but it's his power. And if you think it's in your own abilities and in your own tools, the things that you have at your disposal, if that's where your confidence lies, then you are so sorely misguided and you are toiling in a field, but it is not the kingdom of the Lord. It's in your own field. God will use you. He says, you will be my witnesses. But make no mistake, it's not because you're so great. It's because he has given his Holy Spirit to you. And that is a great truth. These truths need to be held onto or we fall into the air. We are the ones Jesus has called as his ambassadors, his witnesses, his representatives. But in our work, we are totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And this is precisely the case because the work that we do in rebuilding is spiritual, it's not earthly. We aren't rebuilding heaven on earth. It's not constructing earthly cities and establishing human institutions or political regimes, all those things could be done without the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Anyone without the Holy Spirit can build a city and establish some sort of political structure and entity. The work we're doing can only take place through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our work is humble and spiritual. It is to be witnesses to Christ. It is to testify to what Jesus has done for you before the world. You will be my witnesses. It isn't to be great and mighty, and by your significance or power, sway the world to Christ. It is to simply speak of Christ's love and how he offers himself to the entire world as the Savior of sinners and the hope of the nations. That's what Jesus is asking you to do. He says, you will be my witnesses. So the disciples confused the nature of the kingdom, the power of the kingdom, and finally, they confused the extent of the kingdom. And what I want to say here is this idea is tied to the idea of the nature of the kingdom. I recognize that. Um, but I, I want to say a few things from a, a slightly different vantage point. Jesus' last words are, you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. 
This is his last words, his sending words. And Luke understands the importance of these words. Because as we'll see, he uses this sentence right here, this quotation, as the theme and the outline for the book that we're going to study. The first section of Acts, you can, that is the outline of Acts. The first portion of Acts documents Peter's work in Jerusalem, by and large. The second section of the book of Acts describes how the gospel goes into Judea and Samaria. And then finally, the third portion of Acts, we see the work of Paul going out, out to the Gentiles, out starting what we continue in to the remotest parts of the earth, all places and everywhere, the gospel going forth. This verse is one that's critical to the book, but it's also one that's a, a critical truth for the disciples and for our lives. This idea of going out, 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 should not have been new to them. Remember, all Jesus had already talked with them about, telling them that they should go into all the world preaching the gospel. And yet by their statement of Christ about restoring the kingdom to Israel, what is apparent is that they've heard him without actually hearing him. They've heard the words without comprehending the implications, the depth of the meaning. Their vision of God's work ended with the kingdom being restored to Israel. Their expectation of God's love for sinners was much smaller and more measured than his own. The disciples believed that the kingdom was going to be restored to Israel, and Jesus responds by blowing their minds. They couldn't fathom how big and glorious his mission actually was. You are his witnesses. You are his witnesses. That's what he says to the disciples everywhere around the world. The gospel is going to start here. It's going to go out from here to, to Judea and Samaria, and then poof, to the ends of the earth. Everywhere, the gospel will be preached. The work of Christ, the love of Christ, the glory of Christ, the transforming power of Christ will be spoken of. And what I want to say is, you are his witnesses. Wherever you go, there isn't a place that's off limits to the gospel. There is not a place that you are not called by Christ to carry it. And I'm not just saying that you need to go to a different continent here. I'm saying that God has placed you here and given you his spirit and his word, and so what are you doing with it? There isn't a household or an area of town that is too bad for the gospel to work and to reach. There is not a business or a relationship or a circumstance or a place that the work of Christ and the good news of gospel should not be spoken of and attested to. Every area of your life, I was talking with Aaliyah about this point last night, and she said that um, one of the things that I should say is that this applies to you as parents in your homes just as much as it applies anywhere else. She's just been listening to a book, um, I think it's called My Father's House or something, by Corey Ten Boom. It's a follow-up to The Hiding Place. And she was just sharing with me that the work of her life was really bringing people into her home and nurturing them with the gospel. And again, the thing she says time and time again is that parents should never forget that they need to preach the gospel to their children, right? And of course, we do that with our lives. If you don't do it with your actions, you're a hypocrite, and it's, it's, bad, it's bad for your children. But we have to preach the gospel to our children. She says, why on earth would you delay preaching the gospel until they're older? You should be preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel to your children when they're young. And so what I want to say is, uh, those of you who may be spending a lot of time at home at this season in life, this applies to you as well. There is not a place under the sun where the gospel does not have transformative power and where Jesus not only asks you but commissions you to be his witnesses. You need to think about where God has you in life and say, ask yourself, am I faithful? Am I a witness to the glory and the transformation of Christ through my life, through my words, through my actions, to the people God has put me around. You are his witnesses. If you know Christ, then you've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given you everything you need. And so what keeps you back? And should it keep you back? Well, no, it shouldn't. Jesus told his disciples that it wasn't for them to know when the final restoration of all things was going to take place, and for good reason. If they knew, <laughs> if they knew, think about why he didn't tell them. Well, one reason is they'd probably be lazy and lax. How often have 
you've been told, clean the house. By the time we're home, we want the house cleaned. And if you know the time they're going to get home, you know when you start cleaning? About three minutes before your parents get home, right? There, Jesus has many good reasons. The Father has many good reasons not to reveal when he's coming. He just says, do the work and wait for me. You know what time I demand? Your life. That's the time. <laughs> That's the time. So give your life, and I'll come back when I come back. Through the book of Acts, uh, I'm sorry, though the book of Acts is finished, rather, the work of Acts continues today. It's in our church. It's through you and me. As we engage in this work, we must see the kingdom in light of Jesus' teaching. Our work must follow his design. It must be built by his power. The kingdom we build is not earthly. It is spiritual. We aren't building a nation for the sake of the church. We're building the church for the sake of the nations. We can't accomplish this by our own power and strength, but it's by his spirit that we go forth as his witnesses. So does this describe your life? Does this describe the kingdom that you're pursuing, the motivations by which you toil in the king's vineyards? Let's pray.